Alright, before we get going, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We never want to eat without giving thanks, so let's do that. Mm -hmm. Our Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to gather together. Lord, again, we recognize what it took, although not fully do we recognize it, but we know something of what it took. And in order to give us your word like this, Lord, it took the death of your Son. And Father, we know this was your plan from before eternity. We thank you for the wisdom. We thank you for your mercy and your love and your grace and all the things that you bestow upon us. Lord, we deserve nothing, and yet you give us all things. Father, we thank you for the joy and the peace that we find in Christ Jesus our Lord. We ask that you make us faithful witnesses and good ambassadors that we might offer to the world that thing which we have. Lord, if we had a, a disease that we knew the cure for and we know others have that disease, we need to be motivated to give them that cure, and we've got it. It's the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray you build us up in that tonight, strengthen us in it, and make us again able witnesses for your kingdom and for your grace and mercy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Romans 1.16. Now, Paul's got the introduction out of the way, and we started on this last week. He comes to his theme. Verse 16 and 17 is the great theme of this epistle. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now we started looking at this last week, and I showed y'all how the way that he says this, it's, it's a figure of speech known as a lightity, to say it in the negative rather than the positive. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What he really means is I'm very proud of it. But by putting it this way, it opens up uh, a lot of avenues of study. So we're just going to pick... Oh, is that a hiccup? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're just going to pick right back up with it tonight, and we're going to start. Now, why would Paul possibly be ashamed of the gospel? We talked about this because the gospel offends the natural man, doesn't it? Look, all of us want to be liked, and all of us... You know, if you like causing problems, and you like causing contention... Number one, something wrong with you, but number two, you, you've probably got a miserable life. You'll, you know, there are some people that like that sort of thing, but yeah. folks, the gospel causes problems amongst the greatest of friends. The gospel causes problems amongst family, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. You remember Jesus Christ said, Think not that I've come to bring peace. He said, I didn't come to bring peace. Now, he didn't mean he didn't come to bring peace to the believer. He meant to the world. He said what he was going to do in the world was he was going to cause division, wasn't he? between those that believe and those that don't, even amongst families. So then the gospel offends because the gospel basically tells man he's no good. The gospel also offends because the gospel completely disallows all our natural abilities, doesn't it? You know, if you've got any talent or you've got any, um, you know, any strong suit or anything like that that you're good at, and people get together, you want to show that off and you want to talk about it, don't you? But does that play into the gospel? No. It has nothing to do with it. In fact, it, one of the strongest things that will block someone from seeing the truth of the gospel is their intelligence, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the more intelligent a person is, the harder it is for them to believe the simplicity of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And it's the same true with education. The more educated a person gets in today's education, the more, you know, difficulty it is to show them the gospel. But the gospel also offends because the gospel uh, includes suffering, doesn't it? You know, everybody that's in Christ Jesus is not promised a bed of roses. We're promised there's going to be hardships and suffering. And many times, the suffering of the gospel is public, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Now, when Paul wrote this, what was the center of the world? Was it not Rome? Yeah. And Paul's writing to Rome, isn't he? And what had just happened, you know, what, two decades previous, what's still fresh in the Roman people's mind? The crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Now, who in, who was the one that carried out the crucifixion? The Romans. Okay, The Romans carried it out. In other words, it was their form of punishment, wasn't it? But when the Romans carried it out, what did that say to a Roman? Christ was crucified. What did that say? Well, he's a criminal. He's a criminal, and not only a criminal, he's a slave because they didn't crucify freeborn people. Now, when you, when you are going to go somewhere to the most powerful city in the world, where the most powerful leader in the world, with the most powerful army that's ever existed, and you're about to go there, and look what Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. What did Paul say he was bringing to Rome? 
The power. The power. And where does he go? In the most powerful place in the world. And you know, there are those that would argue and say, well, the gospel's not powerful. If a man would just look at history and honestly look at it, he would see the gospel's the truth. Jesus Christ crucified is the truth because what did that gospel message do to Rome? Folks, it threw Rome on its ear. I mean, y'all realize within a little over two centuries later that the Roman Emperor Constantine had to declare Christianity the, the religion of his empire, didn't he? I mean, how far did this message go? It went into Rome and went into all of Europe, didn't it? You know, the, if you read the, look at the history, the Dark Ages, all the European history from, from you know, Christ until, you know, 17, 1800, what's it all centered around? Christianity. Yeah. Folks, it, it's even though I'm not saying everybody was saved, but it was all centered around Christianity, wasn't it? So then Paul has got this message, and this message of the Gospel includes suffering. And lots of times it's public suffering, isn't it? Now, what does public suffering have that goes along with it? Shame. Yeah. Condemnation is shame, isn't it? Hey, you know, a man's not proud to sit in an electric chair, is he? Hey, you know, if you were to, if me and you wanted to get the idea of the cross, we'd go around with an electric chair around our mm -hmm. neck, whereas, you know, people have a cross. I'm not condemning anyone for having a cross. What I mean is this is how they executed a criminal, isn't it? So now you're going to go to Rome, the place where the people that carried this out hail from, and you're going to go there, and what message are you going to bring? The glory of Christ crucified. Now put that in modern language. Imagine somebody coming here today and had the good news to tell, and you say, what's the good news? And they say, I want to tell you about a man that died in the gas chamber. He died for you. What would your reaction be? Oh, yeah. In the gas chamber? Hold on a minute. No, we kill criminals in a gas chamber. And it's just utter foolishness, isn't it? So then the Gospel, it, it, again, these are the things that it's going to do. But y'all flip over to Romans 12. Not Romans, Hebrews 12. In Hebrews 12, I'll show you something that says about the Lord. In verse 1 it says, Hebrews 12, 1, Wherefore seeing, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now the cloud of witnesses is chapter 11. Y'all remember he started with Abel and he went down and hit some of the high points in the Old Testament showing what faith allowed men to do or enabled men to do. By faith, Noah built an ark, didn't he? Right. Did Noah get saved because he built an ark? No. Noah built an ark because he was saved. Okay. Did Abraham offer up Isaac to be saved? Abraham offered up Isaac because he was saved. And not only saved, very mature in the faith, wasn't he? But he's gone down this long list. In other words, when you and I get despondent or we get down, get your Old Testament out and read. Read what God did with some of His great champions. Tell you, if you really get down, and hey, we all do. I mean, we all you know, are, suffer with these sort of things. Read Job. Job yeah. Folks, if Job don't make you feel a little bit, <laughs> you'll say, well, it can always be worse, couldn't yeah. it? But it says about this great cloud of witnesses. He said, let us lay aside every weight. Now, he's talking about someone running a race. How are you going to run a race with a weight on your back? The first thing you need to do is get rid of that weight, isn't it? Now watch how he addresses this. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Beset us to skillfully surround like an army has surrounded you. Is there sin that so easily besets us? Yeah, folks, we're sinners. We've got a sin nature. And we're constantly bombarded, not only by our own flesh and by the devil, but by the world, aren't we? Mm -hmm. So he says, lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Notice the race is set before us, isn't it? And what does that imply? It's right before our eyes. It's right before your eyes. It's out in front of you, isn't it? Yeah. But is your race necessarily my race? No. Your course and my course are different. But who is the great course maker? God. Folks, God sets that course out in front of us, and you and I have got to run the course God gave us. Would God put a course in front of us and not give us what we needed to? No. no. He will. So then, what are the things that will hinder you and I from staying to the faith and staying on the course? He just said it. Sin. Sin. Folks, sin. He, you know, I've told you uh, before, I know, when D.L. Moody, I wrote it in the front of my Bible just because I thought it was so good. It's a great reminder. But when D.L. Moody died, 
they got his Bible that he preached from, and in the very front leaf he had this wrote, this book will keep you from sin, and sin will keep you from this book. Now there's a lot of truth in that, isn't there? Hadn't y'all all experienced that? Mm -hmm. So then, will sin keep us from running our course? Oh, sin will get us off course, won't it? Does that mean we're all going to become sinless? No. See, you get rid of that idea right away when we realize what sin really is. Sin is a condition we've all got. All right? It's not just that it's not, not enough that I don't kill. I can't have hatred towards someone. So I know that even though I'm not outwardly killing, that still flares up in my mind, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So then the idea of being sinless goes out the window. What he's really talking about is, if the thought comes, the temptation comes, what do you do? You put it aside. Lay off that weight, right? Keep your eye on the course. Imagine a fellow's running a race. Let's say a marathon, not a sprint. He's running the marathon, and as he's running, he looks up, and there's an Arby's. Right? What do you think would be his first thought? I'm hungry. Well, it's hungry or even thirsty, anything, right? Or just look at it for a minute. Consider how it would taste and all. You know what he's going to be doing? He ain't focusing on his course. He could be going crooked or whatnot. In other words, he sees that. It's an allurement. It's a temptation. But he immediately gets his eyes back on the road. Now, temptation is not sin. You know, the devil will come and tell you that you've committed sin because you've been tempted to sin. But it's not. How do you know temptation is not sin? Right. Because Christ was tempted in all ways like we are, yet without sin. Okay, so he says then of Christ. We're going to run the race that's set before us, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. Now we've got that whole uh, chapter, chapter 11, of all those great saints that we can look unto, can't we? But who's the ultimate example? Christ. Christ. Right. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So let's stop there real quick. I've got Jesus Christ here, and He's called... See, I'm going to come back here and put it over here. He's called the author... and the finisher of our faith. You know, in, in Revelation, he said that different. He said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's just first and last letter of Greek alphabet. You'd say from A to Z. Who is the author of our salvation? Right. How could you and I claim we made the first move? See, this is what we're going to do. We'll, we'll, we'll have to get into this in the next class. We're, we're going to sit down on these verses for a while because there's so much here. He said the gospel is the power of God, isn't it? You know, it, it's been preached in, in, a, in a deluded manner for so long now, a hundred years or better in our country, that people talk about salvation and they think back to a day when they did something, don't they? Folks, salvation is not the day we did something. Salvation is the day God began to reveal what He was doing in us. And that's the power of God, isn't it? You remember what uh, Paul said to the Philippians? He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. What does that mean? If he starts it, he finishes it. So here I am over here and I'm saved. Well, let's say here's the day that I realized my salvation. Okay, All I really did was realize what Christ had also now done in me, right? Mm -hmm. But I still fall between the author and the finisher, don't I? It's the power of God unto salvation. And that's why Paul said later on to the Philippians uh, to work out your own salvation. He don't mean work out your salvation. He means let it work out of you. Yeah. He said, for it's God which worketh in you. See, what he's basically telling the Philippians is if you're saved, Christ is working in you, so you need to now let that work out of you. It's the same thing James said. Faith without works is dead, isn't it? So when he goes on to say here, that Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. I think I'm... I thought I was going to hear a beating back there. <laughs> okay. All right, so Christ is the author and finisher of our faith. And it says here, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now the first thing I want you all to notice here, did Christ despise the shame? Yes. Why? Because it's shameful. Folks, that's a shameful thing. <laughs> Jesus Christ going to the cross was the... It's literally, he, he took the death of a slave and a criminal, didn't He? And was there shame associated with it? Folks, they stripped Him naked and spit on Him. 
They made fun of it. I mean, y'all saw the Romans had a big laugh. They put a crown of thorns on him. and I mean, they just did horrible things to him, didn't they? So then, if you and I just considered the shame, Christ did not want to go through that shame, but He went through it, didn't He? Now why? I'm going to put Him on this side of the cross just staring at it. Okay? Y'all don't... I know y'all know I can't draw, but let's just say here's Christ staring. He's looking at the shame. He's heading towards it. Right? But it says, for the joy that was set before Him. Hey, y'all know in a race, those men are running that race and they got that ribbon across the line. And they get up there and they all start stretching out for that ribbon that's set before them, don't they? Or another example would be, I hate to do this and please don't take this to be disrespectful, but you remember on the Little Rascals when they would have the cart and they'd have the donkey and they put the carrot out in front of him? What did that amount to? It's, it's to dangle a reward in front of him and he chases after that reward. What is it that Christ, what joy was set before him? Folks, it has the joy of redeeming his people to be with him for eternity and pleasing his Father. His joy, he said, I delight to do my Father's will. Okay? Now, if you delight to do someone's will, you delight in pleasing them, don't you? Would you be willing to do a hard job to please them? Would, wouldn't we? He had one a few months ago, I, I told Sienna about, uh, she said that, look, Aunt Lexi's getting weeds in her flower bed. They start popping up. Now. I said, yeah. And I said, we'll have to clean it up for one day. She'd sure appreciate that. And I went off, and the next thing I know, that kid was weeding. She went mm -hmm. to town. Well, it was hot. It ain't fun. Weeding ain't fun. It, why was she doing it? To please Lexi. To please Lexi. See, she, she endured the sweat and the task and the boredom and whatever. She put off other things she would like to do, didn't she? And she did that because she knew that would be pleasing unto Lexi. So then Jesus Christ left glory. He came down here and took upon Him flesh. What did He have to lay aside to take upon flesh? Everything. Everything. You got it. Y'all go to John uh, 17. John 17 is the prayer the Lord prays. This really is the Lord's prayer. It's the, a prayer He prays to the Father. And it's the, just before He's crucified, that night before. And He says to the Father in verse 4, I have glorified Thee on the earth. I have finished the work which Thou gavest Me to do. And now, O Father, glorify Thou me with Thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Okay? Is Christ going to return into glory? Yes. He's already there, isn't he? Yes. But as he returns into glory, something's different, isn't it? What did he do when he became flesh? Folks, there was a change. Jesus Christ was not flesh in eternity past. He was not a man as he is today. So then, Jesus Christ had both natures, did He not? Okay. Yes. I'm going to put blue and red just to help us see that there's two natures there. When He dies on the cross, is He the Son of God? Yes. And is He the Son of Man? Yes. Okay. He, he's buried. And as they bury Him, who's buried? The Son of God, the son of God and, the son and the Son of Man. Son of man. Okay. Now, what about when He's raised from the dead? He's still the Son. He's still a fleshly man. This is so important about His resurrection. Folks, Jesus Christ didn't come down here and use flesh for 33 and a half years and then be done with it. Jesus Christ took upon Him our nature. He became the mediator. And when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, I'll just put Him here, raised from the dead. Y'all remember what He told them in the resurrection? They thought He was a spirit, didn't He? And what did He tell them? He said, come here, Thomas, touch me. Put your hand in there. And then to really reinforce it, he said, matter of fact, do y'all have something to eat? And they brought fish and a honeycomb and he ate, didn't he? See, he had a glorified body, but he was now different than he was in eternity past. He laid aside the glory he had with the Father, took upon him flesh for 33 and a half years. He suffered, 
He suffered the loss of glory, the, lo the loss of uh, certain uh, aspects of His deity. I mean, He suffered for 33 and a half years. After the three and a half days, there He is. And at the end of, of the 40 days, what do they watch Him do? They watch Him watch go him. up. Yep. What did they watch go up? A ghost? No. The man. The man, Christ Jesus. Now, where is He at today? Right He's right seated at the right hand of God. And what did Paul say He is? The man, Christ Jesus. He, uh, he, George Whitfield put it this way. He said, The Son of God became the Son of Man so that sons of men could become sons of God. Amen. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Okay. So then what Jesus Christ did is Jesus Christ became the firstborn among many brethren. Didn't He? Well, what's the rest of them going to look like? Like the firstborn. Go over to 1 John. 1 John 3. You know, if we make Jesus Christ out to be anything less than the eternal Son of God, we rob Him of His glory and it borders on blasphemy. But if we make Him out to be anything less than a man, we, we rob Him of His glory and it borders on blasphemy. He is the Son of Man and He is the Son of God. Now John says this in 1 John 3, verse 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. <coughs> now, when a person dies today, their soul and spirit, if they're saved, goes to be with the Lord. But what's their body do? It sits in the dirt, folks. Is there anybody got that glorified body up there other than Christ? No. He's called the first fruits, right? We'll just come over here and write it. Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. The resurrection. Okay. Now, literally, what's the first fruits? It's the first, the best. He's, he's, he, Jesus Christ was, it literally regenerated, wasn't he? Okay? Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. Uh, now this is referring to what the Jews had to do when they had a crop. They would get the first that came in and what would they offer? They would offer the first fruits to God, wouldn't they? And then what would they do? Wait on the harvest. See, the best and the first goes to God to show you put God first and then you're trusting God to bring in the harvest, aren't you? But what is the, uh, we're told Jesus Christ refers to our resurrection as? First no, His resurrection is the first fruits. We're waiting on the harvest. He said, in the end of the world, in the harvest, He'll send forth the angels, won't they? And the angels will gather together all His elect. They'll separate the wheat from the tares. In other words, they'll separate the professing Christian from the real Christian. And what is the Christian going to get in the resurrection? A new body. body. If, you, if you're dead in heaven, it says when Christ comes, He'll bring those spirits with Him. And their bodies will be raised and they'll get a new changed body. Right? He said if you're still alive, there's going to be a generation of saints that are going to be alive, aren't they? Mm -hmm. If we're still alive, what did He say? You won't have to die. You'll just be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So right now when you know people will tell you things like, um, well, they're up in heaven looking down at me. And, no, they're not. Uh, and, you know, and I don't, uh, you, you ain't something to argue over. Some folks, those people in heaven are looking at someone that they have totally forgotten, me and you. What are they looking at? Christ. They're looking at Christ. Christ. They, there is no tears. There's no lack of anything. They're in absolute. The only no, thing they're lacking is their new bodies, right? Yeah. No, there'd be no look. I'm go about saying it. How could it be heaven and joy if there was all this need and want and lack and, and worry? No. They're looking in the face of their Savior. Now, back to what Paul said. He said the gospel is the power of God, right? The power of God unto salvation. How did God exhibit His power physically? He rose Christ from the dead. He raised Him up by the power of His Spirit. He raised Him. 
What does that prove to me and you? He can raise us. That's our, that's our assurance, isn't it? It's like the first fruit. You, you go out there and you got a tomato bush and you, you finally got some, uh, say you got a good heirloom tomato and you get a good one and that first one is sweet and juicy and ripe and it's just perfect. What does that do? It gives you hope for the yeah. rest of the bush, doesn't it? What do you expect the other uh, tomatoes to be like? That. Like that one. Do you expect it to start growing cucumbers? No. Uh, you expect it to bring forth after its own kind, don't you? Mm -hmm. Okay, now, back over to uh, uh, Romans 6, uh, 116 again. When Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel... Can y'all see how many ways there is that we can be ashamed of it? You're talking to an educated person. And what's the thing that you're going to tell them about? That a, a man died on a cross that couldn't save himself. They spit on him, laughed him. He could do nothing about it. Now, it's not physically that he couldn't. We know he could have. Sure. But if he did stop him, I mean, you'd die and go to hell. But we're going to tell them how a man who died the death of a slave and a criminal on a cross is the key to eternal life. What's the educated person say? Yeah. Yeah. That's ridiculous. And then we tell them that he, you said, but he died. And we say, but he was raised again from the dead. And they say, oh, there you go, see? Now you're really crazy, aren't you? So Paul's going to Rome, and Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What would be one of the uh, other reasons Paul would be ashamed of the gospel? Who's he going to proclaim? Jesus Christ. Right. Who was what? Crucified. Right. Folks, I mean, seriously, that's, that would be a shameful message in Rome, wouldn't it? But when Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he's also going to go there and proclaim Christ resurrected. What are the majority of people going to tell him? He's nuts. He's crazy. Is that going to stop him? You remember me telling you all a while back, that lady told me, how's somebody as fat as you going to go up in the air? I mean, she made a good point physically, didn't she? But she was telling me that what I was talking to her about was just foolishness. Right. Well, of course it is. The word, the word of God says that the gospel is yeah, foolishness, foolishness. To, the, to the natural man. Mm -hmm. If a person's not born of the Spirit of God, it is foolishness. Mm -hmm. And don't, don't throw rocks at them. You just look at them and say, okay, this person can't possibly understand what I'm talking about here because they've never been born again. What's the thing you need to do? Yeah. Be praying to God to open their ears. In the meantime, what do you preach to them? Preach that law to them and convict them of their sin. Get them worrying. Get them, want, get them wanting to turn to God. Show them, you know, you preach the bad news to them. All right, so Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, what about Paul gets to Rome, and Paul wants to, uh, let's say he wants to limit the possibility of shame. What would be one of the ways that Paul or a man could go about avoiding some of the shame? What if Paul just preached Christ died? Christ was buried, Christ rose again. That wouldn't be that, but it wouldn't be right. Some would say, well, that's the gospel. No. He he has left the cross out to try and limit the shame, hadn't he? You know, if you can change the gospel message to avoid shame, you need to look at what it is you believe. It's going on today, right? It's going on everywhere today. You know, I, I, I need to get in the habit of not using people's names. But there's a very famous TV preacher today, uh, one of the most popular around, and he was on Larry King once, and he's just this super nice, he's got a big winning smile, smile and you know, he's just, a, he's just a, a real motivational speaker. And Larry King, who's a Jew of all things, said to him that there are people, I, he said, I've had people on my show that say, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you can't be saved. What do you say to that? And y'all know that man would not answer that question? He, he beat around about it. And he said, well, I, that's not my job. I mean, there's a lot of ways. And, you know, and he, he just kept going on about it and on about it. And then later on, he said, you have been criticized because you don't... Uh, in, in your sermons, you don't uh, speak about Christ a lot. And you don't know what he said? Yeah. Well, we don't want to offend anyone. Oh. Now, you see? Look, I, again, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm trying to show you what that man's doing. That man is taking away the offense of the gospel, isn't he? Yeah. Why? Does he not want to offend anyone? He don't want to lose any customers. Lose right. okay? that, that's what it comes down to. Yes. He doesn't want to lose customers. And he would. And he would. 
Because when you preach the truth of the gospel, he, I've got a, a, a young man I know that's it's, he, he's starting to preach some now, and he's just, boy, in my mind, he is just doing a fabulous job for somebody his age. And I watched him get up in front of a group and preach the gospel, and he preached to them like they were lost. Folks, if you're saved, do you mind someone preaching to you like you're lost? No. I love to hear it, don't you? I love to hear somebody preach just the simplicity of the gospel. He laid it out there and used several good examples and laid it out there, and then another man got it behind him that, that runs the church, and he started trying to fix it and smooth it over. Why do y'all reckon he wanted to do that? He wanted to keep all those people there. Folks, that message that young man brought was offensive. I'm telling you it was offensive. He, I mean, you, you go to a bunch of people and you tell them essentially, look, I, I know according to the Word of God that there are some of y'all sitting in this building and in fact, probably based on what I see in Scripture, a good number of you are sitting there confident you're going to heaven and yet you're fooling yourself. Because there's a gospel that's being preached that's not the truth of the gospel of Christ. He, I, I brought a quote I've quoted to y'all before, but William Booth, the man that started the Salvation Army. By the way, that wasn't a thrift store when it started. It was a, it was a real Christian organization. Okay, But this is what he said in the late 1800s, speaking about the 1900s, talking about the 20th century, he said this, The chief danger that confronts the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost. Now that's just another way to say Christianity without being born again joining churches and never having been saved. Religion without the Holy Ghost. Christianity without Christ. Isn't that what the man I just told you all about was trying to have? Right. He's claiming the Christian religion, but yet when the man says Jesus Christ, he hunkered down and kind of shamed from the name. Christianity without Christ. Forgiveness without repentance. Now, aren't we all familiar with that? Yeah. The easy believism. You don't have to desire to live another way. Look, all you've got to do is take five minutes here and say this sinner's prayer, and then you can get on back with what yeah. you were doing, and you're safe. No, folks, salvation starts with repentance, doesn't it? God convicts us of our sin, and folks, we want to live another way. We're not living without sin, but I know one thing. I sure ain't happy with it. I don't like my sins. He says, forgiveness without repentance salvation without regeneration. Wow. Now how are you going to be saved if you're not regenerated? What does regenerated mean? Just start. Made anew. Made anew. Born again. Raised from the dead spiritually because what are we all? Born dead in sins. So he says, politics without God. God boy, do we have that oh. now? And he said, heaven without hell. Do y'all realize how popular it is today, these people that teach there's no such thing as hell? Yeah. Hell's not a literal place. And you know, they can present it to you in such a way that if you're not careful, it all sounds real good, and it does. And it, and it can get you, but folks, just sit down on the facts and look at it and say, how can there be heaven without hell? Can there possibly be the love of God? He said that's one of His absolute attributes, isn't it? But does God ever change? Then how can you have the love of God without having the wrath? They both have to be there, don't they? So now, Paul says, if a man will just... Uh, Paul didn't say, I said. If a man will change the gospel a little bit, he can lessen the offense, can he? Let me give you all an example. Go over to uh, Galatians 5. Where there's a negative... Or the, there's always a positive. Yes, sir, Mr. Al. Always. In Galatians 5, now remember what was the issue to the Galatians. Jews who claimed to be believers had come behind Paul and said, look, everything Paul said is true, but you've got to be circumcised and keep the law. Now, what did Paul say? No. No way. He stood up and, and, I mean, he stood firm on it. And what did it cost him? A lot. A lot. It cost him not only a lot of friends, but it cost him physical beatings. And, I mean, he was preaching against the ceremonies of Judaism for salvation, but wasn't he? But Peter did that too. But yeah, he had to stand up to Peter also, didn't he? But look what Paul says in Galatians 5. He says, uh, verse 10, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be none otherwise minded 
But he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. Whosoever he said to stir in this pot and teaching you this. Now notice he didn't name him. I'm sure he knew who the people were. He said that person's going to bear his judgment. But in verse 11 he said, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. What would Paul have had to do to have peace and, and calm and rest and just good times in Galatia? Go along. Just go along. You know the old, you go along to get along? All right. Would Paul uh, compromise the gospel? Folks, what kind of an ambassador goes along and changes the message? An ambassador has, does not have the liberty to change the message. An ambassador delivers a message. Who's the message from? From, from the king or from the president or whoever sent the ambassador. Do you and I have any business changing the gospel? Do we have any business leaving out parts of the gospel because they might offend? Now, does that mean that, look, it, it doesn't mean that we don't temper the way in which we present it. In other words, you've got someone you want to talk to and you know that person has, uh, let's say that person has been judged harshly by the religious world and uh, hypocrites have come down on them or maybe they've seen someone that professed to be a Christian and they've watched them for 30 years do horrible and they're turned off by all of that. And you know this person has a sour taste in their mouth about religion. If you want to present the gospel to that person, do you just barge right in there with the facts? And No. You've got to be wise as a serpent, but meek as a dove, right? So you might temper the way in which you present it, but do you alter the facts? No, no folks. An ambassador cannot alter the facts. If he alters the facts, he ain't an ambassador. Okay? And an ambassador also is not to add his opinion to things, right. is he? Anytime someone's going to give you their opinion when it comes to preaching the gospel, you need to make sure you say, now hold on a minute, what I'm about to say is what I think. You don't ever just present it like it's part of the package, do you? So Paul said if I would just uh, say circumcision was okay and part of the gospel, nobody would be beating on me and wanting to kill me in Galatia. And yet what did he do? He wouldn't do it. He absolutely refused. Now, if you just uh, use some examples. I, I put, put a few things here we can talk about, but if we just present the Lord Jesus Christ as a great human being, right? A great philosopher. Or a great pacifist. Y'all remember that Jesus Christ superstar? He, me and Lexi were watching All in the Family not long ago, and they were they were playing that Jesus Christ superstar. And they had a bunch of hippies in jail, and they were all. Uh, and this one guy said, "Oh, this is turning the world on to Jesus." Well, it presents Jesus Christ as a hippie. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, they went for it, and, and I don't mean that in a negative way. They presented him as what the hippie movement was for peace and love and all that. And from that came what? From that came the heresy that he was married to Mary Magdalene. Had y'all know how all that goes? Mm -hmm. But if you just present him as a great human being, people will follow him. People will follow that, won't they? Well, it's yeah. not offensive. Uh, it's not offensive. Folks, if you show someone a great example to aspire to be, and, and they think they, they, they'll set out to aspire to be that. It's like kids have role models in sports, right? Mm -hmm. Any kid that picks up a basketball, I don't know about today, but a kid that picked up a basketball 20 years ago wanted to be Michael Jordan, right? Well, that's what he was aspiring to be. He didn't hate Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan wasn't offensive. Michael Jordan was absolutely incredible, but a man. They present Jesus Christ like that. If you present Christ that way, then you'll wind up with people who say, oh, that, that was such a wonderful man. He was too good for this world. And, you know, I once heard a, uh, someone say something like this. They said, oh, that poor Jesus. They crucified that good man just like they drove Socrates to suicide. Now, that sounds real good, doesn't it? You can put Socrates and Jesus Christ in the same conversation. No See, that's one way you can change it. You can just present him that way. Or present the gospel in the what would Jesus do movement. Y'all remember what would Jesus do movement? And basically what that said is, it's a moral gospel. And they would say, look, all we need to do is forget about all this blood, that old religion, that atonement and all this stuff. Forget about all the theology. We just need the Sermon on the Mount. You know, this started in England back in the 1960s and it really got big. People said, look, Forget all my, my grandpa's religion. Get all that out of it. Just give me the Sermon on the Mount and I'll aspire to live by the Golden Rule. The moral gospel. That won't offend anyone. But folks, people will follow that. Or you could, uh, you could to put it another way, um, you could say, 
present the gospel in, in that manner, in, in the manner in which, look, you just need to aspire to greater morality. And, and that's, you know, that's the message of Christianity, and people will aspire to greater morality. That's what all the Socrates and all the philosophers were about, you know, higher morality and a higher plane and all that. But folks, that's what the Buddhists are about. It's what Hindus are about. It's what Confucius was about. See, the problem is the Gospel comes along and tells me, first and foremost, I have a problem. I've got a problem. And you've got a problem. And your problem is dire. When you come along and tell someone, look, let me tell you what's wrong with you. They don't want to hear that, do they? And yet, that's what the Gospel really does. Now, I'm not suggesting you go out and say, hey, let me tell you what's wrong with you. I don't mean that. What I mean is, the Gospel comes at a person because it, it shows a dire need for something and it's something that they can never attain on their own, is it? Right. Okay, now, if, if you were to just take it this way. Um, all right, there's a lady I know, very sweet lady, and, and just, just puts on a sweet show of just being the nicest person and all that. But you know, when you start talking about the truth of the Gospel, her fangs will come out. Because the truth of the Gospel is... All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there are some people that will say, not me. Or they'll say, yeah, but I'm not as bad as so-and-so. And you say, yes, you are. And folks, they'll get upset about that. And so that's one, one thing I mean about you can remove the offense of it. But you know, it's also, uh, all right, a good example would be this. Do you all know how they are changing the old time hymns? I mean, they're changing they many of them, yeah. They really are. They take out words and put in words. They do. Y'all know what they take out most often? People say the blood. No, it ain't the blood they remove most Jesus. often. No? I'll tell y'all what you'll find. I'll give you an example. It was uh, Charles Wesley that said, Vile and full of sin I am. And one of his things, right? Does that describe you? Yeah. Lexi will be my witness till the, nearly the day he died. Every week at class at some point, Ralph would say, I'm a vile sinner. Remember that, Lexi? He'd always say, I'm a vile sinner. Folks, Ralph was one of the most socially uh, acceptable. He was a wonderful man, but what did he know about himself? He He's a vile sinner. sinner. You know, a man once said about this, he said, this Christianity is ridiculous. He said, who in the world would go for a job interview and put on their application, vile and full of sin I am? He said, this is what's wrong with your Christianity. That's not, if you're going for a job interview, you'd never say that about yourself. Well, Christianity ain't a job interview. Folks, Christianity is about admitting to God what we are and what we need, Edward. He knows. He, yeah. he does. Well, yeah. Now, I'll give you all another example. At the cross. At the cross, how about we, in the, in the, at the cross, the original version says, would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Now, who likes to be called a worm? <laughs> By the way, the, the word back there in the Hebrew and in, in Job for the worm is a maggot. Yeah. Yeah, a maggot, right? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> who in the world wants to be called a worm? So they changed it. And about 35 years ago, a new version came out that people sing today. Would he devote that sacred head for such a sinner as I? Well, that's a little less offensive, isn't it? But do you all know that they sing now this way, many of them? Would he devote that sacred head for such a one as I? Mm. Now it's just a little example to show y'all how it's changed. From a worm to a sinner to somebody like me, just such a one. And, and that's one of the ways we can change the gospel. You can lessen the offense of the gospel by lessening, knocking the edge off of it. <clears throat> All right, what about if we present it as the self help gospel? Isn't there a lot of that today? Oh, yeah. he, if, on the way down here, Mr. Al, there's a big sign up there. It, going or coming both ways probably. Me and Lexi see them all the time on 65. Worried? Come know to Jesus. The truth and, and know the truth. It, life let you down? Jesus can help. It, it, with that sort of thing. It's a self-help gospel, mm -hmm. isn't it? Alright, now the self-help gospel. You present it that way and people will follow you. Sure. Here, there was one on Highway 59 one time. It's still there. It says, got worries? Come to Christ. You know, you can't make your power bill? Turn to Jesus. Hey, look, I'm not, I'm not making fun of a Christian that believes Christ is going to help them with their power bill. Folks, anything we got comes from God. Yeah. Yeah. But what we're talking about here is nothing more than what the cults offer. Look, can, can a person go to AA and say, I had worries, I had a bad life, and AA made me better? 
I know people that say, you know, I used to be miserable and, and I went to the psychiatrist and he got me straightened out. See, that's not the gospel, is it? It's not, it's not a self-help gospel. It's also not the most popular one today that they call, they actually call it the prosperity gospel, don't they? He, the, the one lady that's so famous, I think, helped coin the phrase, but the prosperity gospel. What is the prosperity gospel? Preach that and people will flock to you, yeah, Lord. Sure. Y'all know it's amazing. They preach to people. Well, you driving an old car? God don't want you to have an old car. He wants you to have a new car. And what's the solution? You come to me and give me an X amount and God will give you tenfold back. Yeah. God wants you to be you sick, not feel good. God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise, they say. God wants you to live a full life. God wants you this and God wants you that. Folks, God wants you to do one thing above all others. Believe on the Lord, Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. The prosperity gospel has got people today by the millions. I mean, y'all see these guys are calling for new jet planes and all that sort of thing all the time. Folks, that's not the gospel. I mean, that's any common sense knows that's just fleecing people of their money, isn't it? See, the prosperity gospel just basically itches people where they want to be scratched. Is that a person? All right, a man preaches. You tired of struggling with your house bill? You tired of having this old car? You tired of struggling to make ends meet? Then come down here and do this and God will reward you. What has that got to do with sin? Nothing. What's it got to do with righteousness? What's it got to do with judgment to come? What's it got to do with Jesus Christ? Nothing. Nothing. Folks, you can go to a Dale Carnegie course and get that. You, you can, you know, I once heard an Amway salesman that presented something like that. He, he was great pitching it. I didn't want any part of it, but he put it out there. Hey, this is the solution to your problems. That's not the gospel. Now, first off, did Jesus Christ promise the apostles prosperity? No. What did he promise them? Jesus. Suffering, Suffering and hardship. Hardship, absolutely. Now, what have we been told? Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Why did the writer of Hebrews say that? He said, you've got a course laid out in front of you, and what's that course going to involve? Mm -hmm. Suffering and hardship. Tribulation and anguish, isn't it? So what did he say to do? Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus for what? Look to see what he did and how he went through it. Did any of the apostles get rich? No. How about healthy? You know, I'm not saying God won't heal sickness, folks, but God don't need some man to you to come put his hands on you and all that. No, just forget about all of that. How do you know God didn't promise anyone good health? Did the Apostle Paul have good health? Yeah. Folks, the Apostle Paul had a horrible health. Did Timothy have good health? No. Paul had one helper one time. He said he was sick nigh unto death. Well, it, he must not have been a believer according to the prosperity message, right? Folks, the prosperity message is nothing more than, than hitting America right where they live because what do Americans worship? Money. 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 So it comes in and it presents an idol in front of them and it uses the name of Jesus Christ. Are they trying to get to heaven through Christ? Yeah. They're trying to get to money, money. through Christ. Y'all see how silly that is? Yeah. It, it's a horrible thing. And folks, there's a lot of well-meaning people out there that have been totally deluded by this. Yeah. Yeah, I, one time I was at a, a nursing home and a fellow was there and he stopped and we were talking and I brought up salvation and I asked him, I said, well, let me ask you, you know, what do you know about salvation? He said, oh, I'm saved. And I said, well, that's great. I'd, I'd love to hear about it. And he started telling me this big long story about how he got approved for a loan on a Hummer. Y'all know them big Hummer cars? And he went through that whole thing. Now, folks, do atheists get approved for loans? I mean, no, it, it, getting approved for loans got nothing to do with it. But after he went through that whole spill about getting this Hummer, that's how he knew he was saved because God blessed him with that Hummer. And I said, and that's a blessing from God. He said, yes. I said, what's the payment? It was like $1,200 a month if I remember. Now, you remember what it was, Lexi? No, I wasn't there. You, okay, it was way up there. Yeah, and he okay said it. And I thought, I said, well, that don't sound like a blessing to me. That sounds like a curse. Yeah. Folks, a blessing from God is a, is a high interest loan. But you see what that man had been taught, that God wants you to have a new car, and so he gave his money to some preacher and got approved for a car. And so in his mind, that meant God was involved. And, and look, that poor fellow had been lied to and deceived and 
you know, Hank Williams Jr. sang a song years ago, they want you to send your money to the Lord, but they give you their address. Hey, don't fall oh, nice. for that foolishness. Remember that one? Yeah. And you say, well, doesn't it take money to preach the gospel? Yeah, folks, it takes money to preach the gospel. But if a man's up there preaching to you about giving, wanting to get your money so you can get a return on your money, you know, you would be better rather than give that guy uh, your money. you got this 10 to 1 chance, he says, or it's going to come back tenfold. If you're looking to make money, that's just investing, isn't it? You've got a better chance to go over to the casinos and put it all on red or black on a roulette wheel. At least you got almost a 50-50 chance, don't you? Yeah. Well, what chance do you have of getting your return on that? You got no chance. And people say, oh, you don't know the truth. I mean, I got a new car. Yeah, and you got all the bills that go along with it and all that. Hey, those things aren't blessings. Oh, no, man, nothing. You know, he, I mean, my sister was laughing one day. She said something about her car. She said, my paint started to peel. And I said, it ain't peeling bad enough to be not be good paid for is what matters, isn't it? I mean, hey, there it is. Paid for. That's a good feeling, isn't it? Hey, you know, you get a new car. We've all had new car fever, haven't we? You think if I can just get this, that'll make me happy and it'll, it'll satisfy me. And how long does that last? It don't last yes, long. By that time, that first or second payment comes around. How do you feel about it? You wish somebody else had it, don't you? And you see, we want to be content with the things we've got and know that God laid our course out. He, Charles Spurgeon said that the way a man can be truly happy, whether he's got a little or he's got a lot, to know that whatever I got came from God. Isn't that the way to do it? That's why Paul said, I can be content whether I abased or abound. He said, I know how to be content either way. Okay, so one more thing about this. Um, if, we, if we take the gospel and we remove hell from the gospel, what have we done? You have tainted the gospel because Jesus Christ came to save us from the wrath of God. Right. It's one of the things we're delivered from. Well, if there is no wrath, I don't need delivering from the wrath, do I? Uh, furthermore, let's say this. Take the discipline away from your children. And what will you end up with? Hellions. Yeah. Hellions, okay. Well, if you the hell, folks, is out there. God's got it out there. It's a, it's a, not only does it promote fear, a good fear, which is the beginning of knowledge, but it's also a disciplinary thing. It, and I don't mean for His children. Folks, hell is out there and it scares us, doesn't it? Yeah. Look, I was, I was raised in a religion that literally scared the hell out of me. I don't mean that as cussing. I mean that's what they did. They terrified you with hell and then had you go through all these hoops to, to try and get out of it. Well, today I'm thankful that at least they scared the hell out of me because I was terrified I was going to hell. Always was. So if you remove hell, you've also taken the gospel and lessened the offense. <clears throat> all right, now... One other thing to say this about Paul. Um, Paul said he was not ashamed of the gospel. Go back over to Romans 1. The reason Paul said he wasn't ashamed. And you know, we can tell a lot about ourselves and how we answer this. Why was Paul not ashamed of the gospel? And why did Paul want to preach the gospel at Rome? Watch in verse 16. For, he said, I want to preach the gospel to you at Rome. For, or because, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. In other words, I'm coming to Rome and I'm going to preach that man that was crucified on a Roman cross. I'm coming there to preach him. For or because. Here's why he wants to do it. I'm not ashamed because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now what ought to be the primary reason when someone says, why are you not ashamed of the gospel? Well, you don't see what it did for me. Is that it? No. Or, well, my life has just been good ever since, and you know what? Things have really looked up since then. Folks, the reason you want to present the gospel is because it's God's plan of salvation for everyone that will believe. Every person you run into, what's their need? They need Jesus Christ. Everybody we run into, from the highest to the lowest, they need Jesus Christ, don't they? If you, again, if there was a disease, let's say you, you, we all had the disease... Um, all right, let's do it this way. Let's say that there was a plague going on, and we're all got people dying left and right of the plague. Nothing can cure it. You've tried everything. You've got right on death's door, and some man come along and said, "Look, let me show you what someone showed me." And they gave you one little bitty old uh, 
mineral to take or one little bitty old treatment to take and it ruined, your plague was gone forever. You have been, you just robbed death. You've been cured of the plague and nothing else would work and this one simple little thing did it. You run into the next guy that comes to you and you say, boy, you look awful. He said, yeah, I got the plague. And you say, well, I wish you luck, brother. And you go on and walk away. What would you be dying to tell that man? That little thing. Let me show you what somebody showed me. Right? And it's the simplicity of the cross, Paul calls it. It doesn't mean it was simple for Christ to do. It doesn't even mean it's simple to understand. It means it's the simplest form of salvation anywhere in the world. It's the only form that makes sense. Why is it so simple? Because Christ did it all. What does He require me and you to believe? Believe Him and what He did. And if you'll believe Him and what He did, He'll put all His work right to your account and He'll start training you up in the knowledge of that, won't He? Mm -hmm. Now that's why Paul wanted to preach it because it's the power of God unto salvation. He, like I told you all about a couple weeks ago about Paul, you, you read him and what you get the idea is anytime there was a soul in front of Paul, Paul said, I'm a debtor to that soul. Right. If you have got cured of the plague, and you run into the next guy with plague, wouldn't you feel a debtor to that man to show him? Sure we would, wouldn't we? Well, there's the greatest reason not to be ashamed. You know, you get ready to talk to someone, you say, this might be embarrassing. They might make fun of me. They might ridicule me, and they will. I've been called everything under the sun. You say, well, they, they might not like me, or they, this might make folks uncomfortable, and this might this, and this might that. You know what you really need to say? This guy might be about to take his last breath. Yeah. I might see him today and never see him again. God might require his soul of him tonight. Is he not worth embarrassing? Yeah. Is he not worth being... I mean, what if we were about to eat a meal and there was poison in the pot? Yeah. And I'd say, you know what? Everybody's looking forward to this meal. If I tell them, they, it's going to put a damper on things. Yeah. It won't put a damper on things like dying of food poisoning, will it? Yeah. Folks, we have a message that the world is desperate to hear and they don't even know it. Yeah. And look, the times are coming quick where, I mean, look, if we keep down the path we're heading, I'll be locked up for what we're doing. Y'all know if we keep heading the way we're going, they'll be coming and knocking on the door and telling you can't do this. Yeah. Well, he, you know, Jesus Christ said, there are 12 hours in the day. What did He recommend we do? Yeah. Work while, it, while the sun shining. Mm -hmm. We need to get on with it like Wayne said. We really do. And I don't mean you've got to jump in and bail up. You know somebody, you, you, we need to preach the gospel to everybody. You know somebody that you just got it on your heart to preach them. Go to the Lord and ask Him, Lord, show me how to present this thing. I can't do it. I'll foul it up just as sure as I'm sitting here. But if Lord, if you're involved and your spirit guides me, you soften that person's heart and the verses will come and it'll come across in a humble way and everything will go just like you want, Lord. I know it will. And you said the gospel is the power of God to whosoever will believe. It's the power of God to all that believe. The Jew first and the Gentile. You know, I could also say it's the power of God unto the rich and the poor. It's the power of God unto the Republican and the Democrat, isn't it? Yep. It's the power of God unto all folks. It's the power of God because God deemed this is how I'm going to do it. This is God's plan. And when did He decide this was His method? Before the foundation of the world. Now what right would me and you have to alter that method one iota? We don't have any right. Okay. Now y'all think one, one quick thing. We wouldn't have covered any of this if Paul hadn't said, I'm not ashamed of the Gospel. If Paul would have just said, I'm proud of the Gospel, we wouldn't even have this class, would we? Exactly. You see how thankful we can be for every word of Scripture? Every. By using that figure of speech called a light, he, he showed that there is a cause for shame in many people. And it is. And, and look, we need to look at these Scriptures and take every word and examine them and go to God and ask Him, Look, look, you some of these great saints that come before us. We got a whole ton of Puritans and great old, you know, writers and use all every resource you can. But folks, pray to God and ask him to show you the truth. He said he wanted you to know it, didn't he? You ask him and he'll show you. Alright, any questions about that? Alright, well let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for your incredible love for us. Lord, I, I just it's incredible to see how you've put this together and it's just humbling to know that we have a part in it. Father, it's humbling to know that you knew us before the foundation of the world. 
Lord, I know we're not perfect. We're not even close. We're just babes in Christ. And yet we could not be more of your children. A babe is as much a child the day it's born as it's ever going to be. And we believe that about ourselves. And we know that about ourselves and our relationship to you, Lord. We thank you for this. We, we offer uh, praise and thanksgiving to you for all you've done for us. And yet we petition you. Lord, give us our daily bread. Build us up and strengthen us that we might, we might become mature Christians, that we might be built up in Christ, that we might be faithful witnesses, and we might be used in the accomplishments and the things of your kingdom. Lord, please, build us up and edify us where we can be useful for you, we can be used in your economy, and we can quit looking at this world and wasting our time on self and get busy serving Christ. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. amen.